Alrighty, folks, good evening, and welcome to the podcast for the uh, 1101 section 54. We're going to look at the evidence sheets and beginning our research for our policy paper. Uh, and we would have been doing this in class tonight already. Um, basically, we would have been um, breaking up into groups and me going around and looking at the research you've done, the detailed plan, as well as the evidence sheets, and working on sussing that out, as well as finding resources to support the policies y'all are interested in. So I'm going to do a mock-up of that here, give examples and demonstrations of how to do just that using the course site and the resources available to us. So you'll know how to fill out the evidence sheet. I'll talk briefly about some policy measures and policy uh, background that can be helpful to everyone um, in pursuing their policy this semester for the final project. So let's see here. We have the evidence sheets, right? So we'll pull up uh, Brookings and uh, ProCon first off, which is where we'll look for the research stuff, um, which will be no big deal here. Cool back here. So pull up those two resources if you can. If you haven't done that yet, we'll do that. Open them up. And then we'll do that. go back here, get the evidence sheet from the assignments tab. So this is just like exactly what y'all going to do um, when you, well, it was what would have been what was happening in class, but what's happening uh, right now as we make up for the class period. Let's see here. What do you have to do? If people are turning in, that's good. Mm -hmm. oh, I can't do that, huh? That's too bad. Submission folder. What do I have? There we go. Boom. Open that. Cool. And we're all set now. Sorry. That's how you can find it. Under the submission folder itself, if you don't have it under the content from the week before, go ahead and pull that up in here. So we're going to do a uh, topic. So let's look at ProCon and pick a random topic, and we'll do a researching on that. Um, <laughs> eeny, meeny, miny, mo. what do you all think? Um, let's go with animal testing, because why not, right? So the basic idea of the policy proposal and the premise of it is that the first thing you all need to do is background research to figure out what is the status of the policy in the status quo. What's the laws that are affected? What's going on right now that's bad? What's going on now that's good? What can you promote? What can you try to get rid of? So what the hell is going on in the now with the policy you wish to affect is the first fundamental question you have to answer to get your harms and your inherency, right? So I don't know anything about animal testing research, really, so we're going to be doing this dry, and we'll see how it goes. I think it should be just fine. Should animal bees be used for scientific or commercial testing? Boom, right after that, we have data and background, right? So we have 26 million animals used every year in the U.S. for scientific and commercial testing. They develop medical treatments, toxicity medications, check products designed for human use, biomedical, commercial, and healthcare. And yada, yada, yada. Um, research on living animals has been practiced since at least 500 B.C. So this is the history, the background knowledge, the uh, statistics that can give you the idea of whether or not you want to pursue this topic all the way and whether or not there's enough evidence and research out there to support the conclusion you wish to draw. So let's say I'm going to do this topic. I like animal research now. I have enough data here to do it. So we're going to begin it. Um, we find sources and articles then to look at. So regulation. So this is right here. Animal testing in the United States is regulated by Federal Animal Welfare Act, AWA, passed in 1966. Boom. There is the beginning policy that you're entering the discussion into if you're doing animal testing. Not only that, copy it. We have a footnote here that's going to give us the exact piece of legislation which entitles the animal testing uh, strictures to what they are today. Look at all the sources right here. Boom. Here is the exact text of the policy, the Animal Welfare Act, that governs uh, the kind of testing that can be done on animals, including amendments. Um, this is the policy, like par excellence. This is a bare bones policy of what would be actually be passed and what is regulatory law. So this is what you're dealing with. This is the world you're entering into in animal testing if you want to do that source. So I downloaded it if I was doing animal testing, which I now am apparently, which is good. I will open up the evidence sheet from my Microsoft Word. Da, 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 da. I will make it large. I will begin editing it. So my name is Aaron Grant. Boom. My proposition is well, let's see the proposition. So this is your plan, not your detailed plan, but the plan uh, line from the United States Federal Reserve Government will blank. F copy and paste that from your other plan sheet into here. So I think it should... Oh, I'm going to say... <laughs> right. 
show. The USFG should extend the provisions restricting animal safety for when used as test subjects for human benefit. Now, how are we going to change this policy? What's the proposition exactly we're going to do? Well, I think we're going to redefine a term in the uh, existing policy, which is a good place to start oftentimes. Uh, so let's look here for like what the definitions are, right? So here's the beginning of the policy. The term person means any individual, partnership, corporation, association, or any other entity. Cotton means this. The hand handler means this. The, 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 the term United States means the, all 50 states of America. In general, the term cotton producing, amenities, separability. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at the regulations right now, it's saying transport, sale, and handling of, handling of certain animals. Congressional statement of policy definitions. Here's where you really get into what can be done to mess with the policy right now and to change it and make it more strict, right? So Congress finds that animals and activities which are regulated under the chapter are either in interstate or foreign commerce or substantially affect the commerce or the free flow thereof. And the regulation of animals and activities provided in this chapter is necessarily to prevent and eliminate burdens upon such commerce and effectively regulate such commerce in order to, one, ensure that animals intended for use in research facilities or exhibition purposes for the use of pets are provided humane care and treatment. Two, to assure the humane treatment of animals during transportation and commerce. And three, to protect the owners of animals from the theft in animals by preventing the sale of those animals which have been stolen. Right? So we can essentially glean from this that the whole basis for the enforcement of the uh, Animal uh, Welfare Act is commerce. Like in, if animals re related to commerce and their transport in commerce related activities. There has to be a profit generated motive uh, interstate in order for the federal government to have jurisdiction to intervene on these uh, conditions of these animals, right? So we could change the wording of this, docu or this clause in the w legislation and that would largely um, affect the uh, enforceability and the scope of the law, right? So instead of talking about um, interstate or foreign commerce, we could talk about Section 1, um, to ensure that animals intended for research facilities or, foreign, or for exhibition purposes. So we could strike research facilities out of that entirely. We could change the law so it would be to ensure that animals intended for use in exhibition purposes, i.e. like showing it 4-H or whatever, uh, or for the use of pets or provide humane care and treatment. Two, this can be the same, to assure the same, humane treatment of animals during transportation, get rid of in commerce, and three, to protect the owners of the animals from their theft or sale and to protect the animals from the uh, unjust abuse in experimental or testing purposes or commerce purposes, right? So we take this and copy and paste these three clauses, right, into the evidence sheet. So the claim is that restricting the commerce clause in the Animal Welfare Act would want to eliminate the well the commercial transport cool. so let's spell check this because I'm doing it all quick on the fly um. okay so the, the supporting claim is that restricting the Commerce Clause in the AWA to eliminate the commercial exception for all experimentation and testing and redefine the legal transport of animals as only for sorry, exhibition and to be cared for as pets. I like 4-H showing horses, breeding dogs, showing dogs at a dog show, um, but not for 
experimentation or commercial use as a non-pet uh, or non-show animal. Right. Boom. As pets. Cool. So the data would be, you can go ahead and pull from the quote here, right? So this is the quote in the law. So this is the warrant for this. The data, rather, is that oh, the current regulatory law states that <laughs> right? So, an animal is intended for use in research facilities or exhibition purposes or for use as pets or provided humane care and treatment. So, this um, ensures the ability for individuals to transport as well as use um, animals for um, exhibition purposes as well as for research and research facilities. And so, if we eliminate the ability for them to transport the animals across state lines. Um, then it would largely restrict the biomedical corporation's ability to get these animals because any time a load of animals was moving across state lines for research, it would be considered inhumane and the federal government could act by enforcing um, a, a seizure or a heavy fine or a um, legal prosecution against those people illegally transporting animals. So this is, gives us an enforcement mechanism without actually changing like a massive law. It makes it regulatorily impossible to do what's being done right now. It's kind of a way to use the bureaucracy like in your favor for once if you want to change the policy. Man. The warrant would then be with the change of the wording to basically what I just said to exclude the transport of animals for testing or purposes that USFG could intercept and seize any Boom, got it. Okay. The source is. Come on now. Right here. It's the Title Seven Agriculture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is the Chapter 54 of the U.S. Federal Registry for Agriculture. So we hear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not helpful. So U.S. Department of Agriculture. They make the law. <laughs> so there's a difficulty of the MLA bibliographic entry, right? So we're going to go to get rid of that. I'm going to find this document citation to the end. 
Mm -hmm. We go chapter 54. Mm -hmm. Let's find the actual. All right, cool. So now we'll go to back here. Here, so here is like in the uh, footnotes and sources for this. Here's the bibliographic entry already for it. Um, in their bibliographies, we just copy and paste this. Luckily enough, right? Boom. Change the font to match your actual font for the document. Citation would be AWA and then space, whatever page number it is. So this was on 122. So boom. And I found it through Procon resource. Done and done. Save it. Submit the evidence sheet. Done deal. Right, and that way when you go back to do the, the uh, outline and the actual uh, policy work, you'll be able to see that you're just going to cut and paste this into the outline, cut and paste this into the outline, cut and paste the, all this stuff into different parts of the outline, and you'll have the paper essentially written, except for it will not be in a prose form. It'll, it'll, not, it'll be in like an outline form, but you'll be able to fix that, no problem. I'll bold the actual answers I put here so you can differentiate them. <laughs> there we go. I'll post this to the website too so you all can have a look at it and see as an example um, if you didn't watch me fill it out how to go about that as well. So I'm going to get rid of that here. Pull this back up. And the course side on right here. Go to the uh, course home. Upload this guy. Mm -hmm. I'll do another one here in a second, so we'll see. Pump, 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 attach a file. Desktop, if it'll work. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Come on. Let's pin. There we go. That's me right here. That's off. Come on now. Got it and good. Ta -da -ta -da -da. Okay, done. So now you can see that too. All right. So now I'm going to briefly talk about, um, I guess, what we're going to do with uh, healthcare. If anybody's interested in the healthcare topic, um, it's important to have some more background knowledge than what we normally think with this uh, particular area because there's a lot of misnomers out there as well as a lot of rhetoric that's flying around that um, kind of diminishes from the actual understanding of the topic. Um, so let's briefly go back and look at Brookings as a research for background information, right? If we're doing a healthcare policy as our topic, we should look at the basics from Brookings and from Cato 
or, in, or from Procon and see what the arguments out there are and what they think is wrong, what the pundits think is wrong with the system, right? And then evaluate that ourselves. So, healthcare, go. <laughs> Topic. Sure. Access to healthcare done. Right, and so that's the biggest thing that we hit right off the bat is in the healthcare debate and the healthcare discussion. The right to have healthcare is being produced as an individual right. Everyone has a human right to healthcare is one argument, and that's fine. We can take that as it is. Um, the question then is, though, then how does the government policy work to enforce that right or work to uphold that right? Um, and the result is that the government policy up till this point in time, as you'll find by doing research, has not addressed the uh, providing of health care or getting to make sure that right is restored or able to be accessed. It's about providing mandatory insurance coverage for those individuals who um, are not below the income line needing uh, subsidies for um, insurance premiums. Right, which doesn't actually provide access to healthcare because there's still another step away from the fact that the policy is not making the rubber meet the road. So at the point in time when we agree that having healthcare is an individual right and a human right, then if we're going to actually uphold that in the country, we need to do a better job of making the access actually tra have traction and not merely having a funding mechanism to try to defray costs of whether or not somebody can actually access the, or pay for the care they access. Because the thing is that oftentimes, even with the insurance from the ACA, the access to care is not there, and the problem is not being addressed because of that. There's still a structural problem that people don't have access to care. Care and insurance are different things, right? So you have uh, car insurance, right? You have crappy car insurance, or you have great car insurance, and you get in a car wreck, and um, your car gets totaled. It was your fault, though, and so you have to pay all the money out of pocket. Does the fact you have car insurance mean you get a new car? No, you still have to pay money, you still have to see an assessment, you still have to make sure that your deductibles and your liability is taken care of first out from underneath it. So the having of insurance is not a guarantee of a service provided. In fact, it's a hedge against that, right? So I'll explain more as I go on. Um, let's look at here. Here's reports. This is great. Nurses and Marys and the promotion of community health. So the whole idea with the provision of health care, right, is that because there is a subsidy from the government for certain kinds of insurance, especially we can look at the effects of this with Medicare and Medicaid, is that Medicare and Medicaid by the government only reimburse doctors at 31.3 cents for Medicaid per the dollar and for 48.2 cents for Medicare, meaning that a doctor who takes a Medicare patient under any, under any kind of specialty, um, instead of getting paid the value of their care on the insurance market or the going rate, they're going to make either a third of that dollar or they're going to make less than half of that dollar if it's the government insurance they're taking, which is fine. The government has power because they have the biggest client base and the provisional uh, umbrella to apply these kind of standards. However, when you have private doctors and practitioners who then say, well, we have people who are paying full price with their insurance company, and so we're going to not take the patients who have the government-provided health care insurance because it's fundamentally uneconomically feasible for us to do this. And so at this point in time, you have a diminished amount of the people who have the insurance for all being able to access care even more than it was before when there was a even keel of uh, private insurance companies hedging because there was enough private insurance in the market to float that people who had the government insurance would be let on part, uh, under part of the patient load for doctors who could make up their money elsewhere. So now what you have is an increasing number of individuals who are getting reimbursed at less than their actual cost of care provision is. And so it's not beneficial to be in the medical uh, field for a lot of specialists. And so what's happening now is that we need to, if we don't address this problem, right, addressing the mere insurance provision is not going to do this. We need to address access to care. So we need to address like the number of personnel in the field as well as the affordability of the treatment from the individual, from the doctor, and their ability to see more patients. So one way that we could look at doing this is through regulatory reform. So you have the American Medical Association and the FDA, which have structures upon what kind of doctors and what kind of specialties and what kind of training can prescribe medications, can diagnose clinically, or give prognoses on different conditions, or even administer a certain kind of shot or administer a certain kind of treatment, have to be, have a certain level of qualification in the AMA. If we released some of these strictures and allowed like CNAs and allowed um, charge nurses or um, pharmaceutical doctorates to diagnose or prognosticate um, in more with more freedom, that would open up the ability for doctors to see more patients because their burden would be relieved largely because of the um, regulatory relaxation that would happen there. 
again, this is not like a hard and fast policy, but it's an idea of how we can mess with the system to deal with the actual structural problems we have with healthcare provision and healthcare access in America, as opposed to the funding of insurance policies, which do not guarantee access to care. Um, so that's a brief background on like some different things about the uh, healthcare question, the healthcare topic that we can think about as well, and as we go forward, see how this kind of applies to more than just the healthcare topic, right? So let's look at another study here, and we'll fill out another evidence sheet and be good to go. Um.